So I'm going to talk to you now about another tall building, of course. Uh, and I appreciate very much in, the, uh, in that nice film that Harry showed that uh, one of the great things about 432 Park is that you can see other high rises and the synergy between, uh, as King Kong was coming in the window, you'd see in the background the Empire State Building or the uh, Rockefeller Center, uh, the RCA Tower. Um, so the synergy between these high rises, and hopefully this, this will join on the skyline, uh, 432 Park and ba Bank of America, et cetera. Uh, the building is, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, the sort of story of how this building has come uh, into the stage now of the deconstruction of the site. The building is approved. Uh, its site is actually quite relevant to us right here uh, because it's connected to the building that we're in. Part of the project has to do with the tunnels of Grand Central Terminal underneath of us and the stairways and platforms and so on. The site is right uh, next to Grand Central between Vanderbilt and Madison Avenue and between 42nd and 43rd Street. It is a uh, 30 FAR building, so the story I'll tell you has a little bit to do with how the building was approved and what it shows about the policies that today are uh, becoming uh, much discussed and even put into practice now uh, in Manhattan. So uh, to begin with, uh, this painting by a, a British and Midlands painter, L.S. Lowry, the painter of matchstick men, uh, is relevant because it's a, a, a picture of a station which is integrated with everything around it by bridge. Everybody in the painting is in motion. Even the, the railway station looks like a train. The buildings which thread their way under the, the bridge look as if they're in motion. And there's some idea about the integration in a proper urban design of the transit node with all of the built structures around it. And so we think about how train stations combine with very dense structures, high-rise structures. One of the early, the uh, Nervi and Gioponti Tower, the uh, Pirelli Tower in Milano near the Stazione Centrale. Well, this, these buildings are not very connected either in style or in the gestures of the buildings, one a kind of palazzo uh, made out of a technical building, a train station, and the other, a modern tower, made into a structural expression. But today, we see in San Francisco, the a great Transbay project and um, Cesar Pelli's Salesforce Tower, uh, the coming together, and you can see it here in this section, which cuts through this podium that will include a bus station, rail below, retail, and very interestingly, a park above. This is a truly an integrated structure which is bringing together the tall building with its urban habitat in a very advanced way. Other examples we might think about, uh, this is the Hauptbahnhof in Berlin, the Gerk von Gerken project which uh, laces uh, at cross axes uh, transit, shopping, multimodal movement, and uh, sort of a, it's a piece of the city, and yet in this case it's somewhat removed from the fabric around it. Someday maybe it will glue itself back together with the city. And in Hong Kong, uh, many of you are familiar with the central station, uh, which leads to the airport, but also connects to the IFC tower, uh, hotels, uh, shopping centers of uh, Lane Crawford, etc. But it's very much of a, an integrated network of high-rise building and of uh, of train, uh, uh, transit uses, which is a great paradigm for us to learn from. And so what shall we make of this site? Now, you see that with a question mark sits right next to the sort of golden uh, toned building of Grand Central Terminal. And the site uh, had been assembled by S.L. Green over many years and finds itself in the sort of uh, middle, if you will, of the belt of Manhattan. And you see the gray shaded area which refers to what is known as East Midtown, for those of you who are visiting from out of town. And that patch of East Midtown, of course, is connected to one of Manhattan's and New York City's great rail terminals, the other being Penn Station. Uh, Paris on the other side, uh, and, and other cities more so, being models of multi-multi uh, transit centers, uh, forming, in, in that case, a star. Uh, whereas we in here in New York are sort of a two-chambered heart. We have two major transit nodes, and this is very important for this site. 
And the city is uh, a, like a human body in a way. It has a heart and has appendages, if you will. And so the, the question of circulation of people becomes a very, very important part of the design of a tall building, which brings the highest density for the footprint of a piece of land to use. Now, um, it's how does the circulation of uh, this area of Midtown East, how does it function? And what are the challenges or the opportunities of bringing a, a tall building of a close to 1400 foot uh, building, which will be, make this Midtown's tallest office building? Um, how, do, how do these forces come to work? Now we see in, in a way, this is a kind of a, a parallel to the, the, the uh, uh, chambers, the arteries of the human body. These are the tunnels that have been bored. This was, uh, photograph was taken about two years ago underneath us here, as we sit in this room, but way underground, to allow east side access train system to bring population from Long Island into Grand Central, whereas previously all that transport had to go to Penn Station. So this is, in fact, doubling the ridership, we'll see in a moment, of the, the peak hour loads to this part of town. So the building of Grand Central, which Warren and Wetmore had designed and, and completed a little bit more than 100 years ago, is itself a kind of chamber of the heart with uh, a maximum number in, uh, for its period, and maybe even for today, of sectional maneuverings of tunnels, tracks, ramps, bridges, even the great ground floor of the uh, great hall of Grand Central is actually depressed a floor. So there are very interesting manipulations of section which allow this to be a most efficient transit node. So today we have a site just adjacent to the station and this site is most interesting not only for the 1400 foot of structure and of uh, office plates, it is an office building which will rise towards the sky, but more important for our discussion today what happens at the base of the building. And so, rather than being a new structure, as in those circulation systems that we see in Hong Kong Central Station, this is more of an implant. We have the opportunity in one 43,000 square foot, roughly one acre site, to implant something which will profoundly influence the body and maybe even the heart of our city. You see the connection here, schematically illustrated, between the transit hall at the base in that sort of light peach color and a series of uh, escalators, of tunnels, uh, very abstractly shown here, which will lead into the building that we are now designing so that the building actually will be, in a way, Grand Central West. This piece of private property that is a development of office space is also a train station. And that sort of combination of the tower and the station, here the tower and the Basilica of San Marco used as a reference, is a very interesting uh, challenge, opportunity for an architect to combine this sort of temple of the space which we view as the center of our city here, a religious center now around us here at Grand Central, a center of, of civic pride, uh, with something that stands as a symbol of the city to be seen from a great distance, the Campanile here in Venice. Now, the project has been undertaken by a developer, SL Green, which is uh, the largest, one of the largest uh, land owners or owners of commercial property in Manhattan. Here, Mark Holliday and Steve Green, who were behind the assembly of land and now the development of the building. You can see here in, in blue, their amassed areas of uh, office space, primarily an office developer. Uh, compared to others uh, by some metric. I'm sure it's, it's their own metric, but makes them look very strong and powerful, which they are. And so they sponsored early on uh, a study. They came to KPF and asked us how we, along with the brief which we mulled over with them, could reinterpret uh, the use of this block, which isn't currently occupied by buildings that are coming down, but are already 18, 19, 20 stories tall. So you can see the range of ideas that, that were applied uh, coming from plans that started inside the building but manifesting themselves in these sort of sculptural forms. And ultimately, we settled on something in our early discussions that uh, was a little bit more rational than some of the early schemes. Manhattan is a grid city. It thrives when we work with right angles, but it's also significantly tapered as it moves towards the top.
And that design then developed. There was a competition uh, after the initial studies, but the client came back to KPF to, to uh, then move ahead with the project. And you can see here a kind of evolution of an idea that the tower, because of the complexities at its base, would consist not of a single block of tapered form, but of a nested series of four individual elements that would come together at the top in the form of a crown. Uh, the building is, in a way, like a flower. Flowers and other natural forms have a kind of a contra contrapuntal motion that brings uh, a natural form to its apex. And this, in a way, is no different. You see some of the floor plans which diminish in size from 40,000 to 15,000 as we move to the top. And then uh, here you see the uh, competition team. This was the KPF team. Uh, Gene Cohn, our founder, is in the background here. Trent Tesh, one of my partners. And uh, this was at the end of the kind of crucible of the creation of the design of the first three or four weeks in which this competition took place. And then uh, emerged this sketch scene uh, of the tower seen from Bryant Park. And then we see the building on the skyline. Now, very quickly, I want to explain a bit, uh, both to New Yorkers and those from abroad, uh, about the approvals process in New York. This building took about four or five years to obtain approval. There is a complicated process of universal land use uh, 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 review, ULERP, um, and the building was actually defeated in, it, in the first round of such application for its density of 30 FAR. It, it rode on a policy that was propounded by Amanda Burden, then the chair of city planning, and in a way the godmother of this project, to reinvigorate an old part or a part of Manhattan where buildings were generally not new and advanced, but a bit aging and a bit tired in their technical specifications, in what they offered in terms of energy use. And so um, you could see here a view across Midtown looking from the north, and you see here all of these buildings, which are shaded here uh, to the exception of the rest of the city, are projected to be built by the year 2030, and most of them occur in the right-hand side of the image, which is the western part of Midtown. The eastern part, where you see number 17, the red structure, is notably a little bit thin for tall towers. And part of the reason for this east Midtown zoning uh, proposal that Amanda Burden and uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg put forward was to bring more density to the heart where the transit center already exists. And so such strategies were brought to uh, public scrutiny, they were voted on, and ultimately was the very end of the administration, and this initiative failed. Even the mighty uh, Michael Bloomberg could not bring this to bear, partly because it was brought so much to the end of his administration. But um, the, the idea was resurrected under Mayor de Blasio, and uh, with uh, uh, current city planning administration into a smaller set of ambitions to reinvigorate this particular corridor along Vanderbilt Avenue. So part of the responsibility given to the developer was to uh, enhance and, and facilitate better transit towards uh, uh, from this site and sites around it underground and at street to make this a better network. And ultimately, well, you could see the problems that we face on some of our subway platforms. And ultimately, it's not an easy uh, transport experience in some cases. You, one really is crammed together. This was used by the developer to try to raise a little consciousness about this particular problem. And part of the responsibility of the developer, in exchange for getting an FAR uh, amounting to about half a million square foot extra of area was to provide $200 million of funding to improve the platforms below grade, off-site. And so this doubling of the peak hour load, which you see represented here, would much of it be brought into the mixing chamber, which you see in yellow here, of the plan of this building. So it could serve as a place where pedestrians could come up from below, the geometry of the building is very much sculpted in order to allow better visual and actual passageway from place to place. You could see the building, although one of the densest buildings in New York by FAR, seems to lift itself off the ground so that views towards Grand Central Terminal, our great landmark of the area, 
which had been blocked for 100 years by the existing buildings, are now going to be opened up by the transparency of the base. And you see from the opposite side now coming from Grand Central Terminal, looking at the building, and now a sort of a, almost a section elevation uh, cutting through the street of 42nd Street, looking at the relationship between Landmark and the new tower. And part of the responsibility of the uh, developer is to make a public space at the base of the building. This is closing Vanderbilt Avenue and making it into a plaza. James Corner has done this initial design. Uh, and so the urban habitat, the station, and the tower have this relationship, not of being glued to each other, but plugged in underground so that there can be a kind of independence of structure and outdoor public space, meaningful public space, at street level. Also, you see that green wall is just sort of a placeholder for an art wall inside a corner of the building that will be a transit hall. That transit hall seen from the outside here, from the inside here, will be a 24-hour open facility that's part of, really, the MTA, part of the train and subway sequence. So it's a win-win situation, we believe, for public and private. You see that connection here between uh, pathways underground to link Grand Central to these train halls. Another section here showing you how far below ground the east side access tunnels are bored and what kind of conveyance of escalator and stair would bring one up into very grand spaces within the base of this building. Here seen from the viaduct, which is a piece of early 20th century infrastructural fancy, but we've compounded this inside the spaces of the one Vanderbilt Tower. And so finally, to think about the top of the building, uh, the base is probably the most important part of the architectural design, but the top is also uh, a, a great opportunity. And building and designing next to uh, the great Van Allen Chrysler building is quite a challenge. We thought of these two as dancing partners almost, more curved on one side and more uh, rectangular and angled on the left side. But still, the importance of the top, and here you see in the model form, and we're in the lower building sort of uh, uh, between the towers right now, but we will be between these two, um, sort of uh, in the dialogue between two towers uh, when the building is finished in 2020. And the top of the building then becomes not an inert uh, area for mechanical systems and for a structure, but an occupied zone. Um, you see here, uh, we will coordinate our way around uh, window washing machinery and, and the like, but there will be at the top of the building public space access directly from below grade so that there can be a kind of, if you will, a sort of a rainbow room experience at the top. And the top then in the concept model shown as a crystalline structure seen from the outside as transparent, from the inside offering great experiences and views in these trays. And so it brings us back, the final image I want to show you is one of Grand Central Terminal. The original building then had its vision of the heavens, the constellations that are depicted on the fresco at the vaulted roof of Grand Central, and uh, in a way have given us the ambitions for this building to connect a real vision of the stars to this uh, pictorial and virtual vision that was painted in 1913.